Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. Today we have our weekly look at the headlines with the AMA's Vice President of Science, Medicine, and Public Health, Andrea Garcia in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Welcome back, Andrea. Hey, Todd. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start off with some vaccine news. The Pfizer bivalent booster has now been authorized for certain children. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, so recently we saw the FDA authorize Pfizer's bivalent COVID-19 booster, and that's for kids under five years old who were previously vaccinated with three doses of the original vaccine. Uh, children six months to four years old who completed that original monovalent three-dose primary series more than two months ago can now receive a single booster dose of that updated bivalent booster. We know that since December, children in that age group who completed two doses of that original vaccine uh, were eligible to receive the bivalent booster as their third shot or that last dose in their primary series. So this new authorization is for young children who completed their three doses before the new updated bivalent booster was available. So is that what's driving the authorization or something else? So yeah, FDA said that the decision was based in part on clinical trial data. Uh, they looked at data in 60 children in that age group who previously received three doses of the original vaccine and were given one dose of the company's updated booster. And one month after the children received that booster, they demonstrated an immune response to both that original COVID strain and to the Omicron BA4 uh, and BA5 subvariants. Uh, Dr. Marks, the the director of the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research uh, said in that FDA statement that the authorization provides parents and caregivers uh, for children six months to four years of age who received that pre uh, primary three-dose series of the monovalent vaccine an opportunity to really update their children's protection. Uh, we know that vaccines offer the best protection against severe outcomes, and it is important to stay up to date uh, including with the bivalent vaccine. Andrea, uh, I'm glad to uh, ask you this next question. Something that's been on my mind, I know, uh, is about another round of booster shots uh, for certain adults. Where where does that discussion stand? Yeah, and there, there was a recent report by the Wall Street Journal that said that FDA is deciding on whether or not to authorize a second round of that bivalent booster vaccine specifically for the elderly and other people at high risk of severe outcomes from COVID. And that final decision could come within a few weeks. We know some people who are at high risk of severe outcomes have already been asking their doctor for a second round of that booster, even though we know that FDA and CDC have not signed off yet. Um, we're also hearing some infectious disease experts call on federal health officials to, per, to really permit another round of boosting to better safeguard these people. And we've seen uh, the UK and Canada move forward and, and to allow that. Yeah, I've read about that. Um, and I'm curious if there's data to support more booster shots. It's been a while since they were originally uh, uh, available. Well, we know the bivalent shots offer more protection. People who got that updated bivalent uh, vaccine are 14 times less likely to die than unvaccinated people and three times less likely to die than, than vaccinated people who received only that original vaccine. And that's based on data from the CDC. But there isn't a lot of data on how long that protection from those uh, bivalent boosters lasts. Um, we know that studies of the original booster showed that protection against infection weaned over time, but protection against severe disease lasted longer. Um, I think given that, it's assumed that the immune defenses of the elderly, others with weakened immune system who got that booster late last year or some about six months ago now uh, would benefit from another booster. Well, we'll definitely keep our eye on that and look forward to more updates uh, because we know that staying up to date with vac uh, vaccinations is so important. Uh, and on that topic, there's a new study that shows how one surprising factor can influence vaccine effectiveness. Andrea, what's that surprise? Well, that factor is sleep. And we, we know sleep is important for optimal health. And this new study 
uh, is looking at the link between sleep and vaccine effectiveness. And that study was published recently in the Journal of Current Biology. It did a, a meta-analysis on existing research on sleep and immune function after vaccination, particularly against influenza A and Hep A and B. And it found that sleeping less than six hours the night before getting a vaccination can limit your body's response to the vaccine, reducing protection. And, and interestingly, that impact of poor sleep on immune response to a vaccine was highly significant in men and smaller uh, and not significant in women. That's so interesting. Why, why the difference? Well, there was a neurology professor who was quoted in a recent article who said there are known uh, sex differences in immune response to foreign antigens like viruses. And in general, women have stronger immune responses, including to the flu vaccine. However, these differences can become less pronounced over time with hormonal and other changes. Um, the study's co-author, Dr. Michael Irwin, said that regardless of your gender, if you're sleep deprived, jet lagged, worked a night shift or have swings in your sleep-wake cycle, you may want to consider delaying your vaccination. I do think we need some larger scale studies to better understand uh, these implications going forward. I guess it, uh, obviously then it's still early, but do you think uh, this would be true of COVID vaccines as well? So the study didn't include an analysis of antibody response to COVID vaccines, but the study authors do uh, believe that those same results would apply that team did a perform a further analysis, which showed that if a person arrived for a COVID vaccine without adequate sleep, their antibody response to that vaccine uh, would be weakened by about two months based entirely on their body's initial response. And most adults need seven to eight hours of un uninterrupted sleep to achieve that restorative sleep. And that's based uh, uh, on what we know from CDC, but sleeping, six or fewer hours a night, which many people do, can create a number of health problems um, in addition to that reduced immune response. You know, uh, the subject of sleep is just seems to be uh, in the zeitgeist right now. So much talk about it. I think we're going to have uh, an update dedicated to that in the future, looking at my crystal ball right now. Um, Andrea, let's move to a new topic. Uh, last week was the first time that we talked about uh, this deadly fungus that has been spreading quickly in the U.S. Any updates on that? Um, not really a lot new, but I would just, you know, refresh people's memory that last week CDC said that deadly fungal infection known as Canada auris or C. auris is spreading at an alarming rate in healthcare and long-term care facilities across the U.S. I think that's important to keep in mind that this isn't in the community, it's really in healthcare settings. Uh, C. auris is more likely to affect patients who have weakened immune systems, who receive a lot of antibiotics, or have devices like tubes going into their body. So think like breathing tubes, feeding tubes, catheters. Uh, something we didn't talk about last time was symptoms, and the most common symptoms are fever and chills that don't improve after antibiotic treatment. And those symptoms of CRS can depend on the part of the body affected because it can cause different types of infections, so bloodstream infection, wound infection, or even ear infections. Uh, is there any way to prevent it? So according to CDC recommendations, uh, several infection control measures can help prevent C. auris, uh, including hand washing and thoroughly cleaning and disinfecting hospital environments equipment that is shared among patients. So think blood pressure cuff, temperature probes, ultrasound machines should be thoroughly disinfected. We know that alcohol-based hand sanitizer is the preferred hand hygiene method for C. auris uh, when, when your hands are not physically soiled. And PPE, including gowns and gloves, should be used to reduce the spread of infection in healthcare facilities. Um, it's key here to ensure that all healthcare personnel adhere, adhere to those infection control recommendations. That's really critical to preventing transmission. Well, that is, uh, that's good to know. Um, believe it or not, we've got another outbreak to worry about. I know you're getting lots of questions on this particular topic. Um, tell us more. Yeah, so there is an ongoing Marburg fever outbreak in Equatorial Guinea, and that's been something we've been watching. And according to a recent Stat News article, it's significantly larger than had been previously acknowledged. 
Uh, this is according to new information that was released this week by the WHO. Uh, they warned that there may be undetected chains of transmission. Uh, that article um, uh, showed that the latest update uh, shows the number of confirmed and probable cases has grown from nine to 29. Um, some of those have links to known cases, others do not. And that's where we're seeing that suggestion that there's the potential for undetected uh, community spread. Um, and I think that's not all. We know that on Tuesday, Tanzanian authorities announced that they too had detected their country's first Marburg outbreak. To date, there have been at least eight cases there, five of them fatal. Andrea, Marburg virus is not something we hear a lot about. I do know one thing, it's serious and you don't want to get it. Um, for those of us out there that uh, want to know a little bit more, can you give us some background on it? Yeah, so it's a close relative to the Ebola virus. Uh, it spreads through direct contact with broken skin, blood, and other bodily secretions from an infected person. It can also spread uh, through handling of material such as bedding and uh, that are that's contaminated with bodily fluids. We don't have any approved vaccine or antiviral treatments for Marburg virus. Patients are generally treated with supportive care, uh, primarily oral or intravenous fluids to replace those lost through vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, and containment efforts are being put in place to help prevent international spread. Um, I think we're hearing from WHO that you know the risk here in the US right now for this is low, but it is something we're keeping an eye on. All right, Andrea, thank you so much. And please keep us updated as news develops there. That's it for today's update. We'll be back with another episode next week. In the meantime, you can see all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today and please take care.